Atrial fibrillation is a common cardiac arrhythmia characterized by rapid and uncoordinated contractions of the atria, known as fibrillations. Normally, the heart rhythm is a product of electrical discharge at the sinoatrial node, followed by conduction of the signal across to the right atrium via Bachmann's bundle, leading to atrial contraction. From here, the impulse moves down through the atrioventricular node, through the bundle of Hiss, and into the Purkinje fibres, causing ventricular contraction and a coordinated beat. In atrial fibrillation, there is abnormal electrical activity that leads to the atrial muscle fibres contracting at different times, giving a quivering or fibrillating activity. Only some of these electrical signals get conducted down into the ventricles and making them contract. There's no real pattern of which impulses will get conducted, therefore we end up with a textbook irregularly irregular heart rhythm. But why does this happen? It's usually the result of fibrosis of the atria and aberrant electrical activity commonly coming from the opening of the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. When the atria become dilated, this leads to activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which, over time, leads to the fibrosis. So conditions that cause the atria to dilate may cause atrial fibrillation. These include valvular disease like mitral stenosis or regurgitation, and heart failure. Ischemic heart disease may also contribute to the substrate changes, as can inflammation or infiltration of the heart, such as in sarcoidosis or amyloidosis. Non-modifiable risk factors for atrial fibrillation include age, as around 70% of all people with atrial fibrillation are between the ages of 65 and 85. Genetics is another factor, as well as sex with males thought to be more commonly affected. Modifiable risk factors are a sedentary lifestyle, obesity, smoking and alcohol consumption, hypertension, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, and hypothyroidism. Although often asymptomatic, most patients experience symptoms at some point. The most common are dyspnea, meaning shortness of breath, palpitations, chest pain, dizziness, and fatigue. These can be the result of the irregular rhythm, an inappropriate heart rate, and loss of the atrial kick, which supplies around 15% of the cardiac output. Ultimately, there is reduced left ventricular filling and reduced cardiac output. The rate at which the atrial electrical activity is transmitted to the ventricles can lead to an excessively slow or fast heart rate, termed atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular response or rapid ventricular response, respectively. Having atrial fibrillation increases the chances of significant other pathologies. It is thought that one in three strokes are caused by atrial fibrillation. If we look at Virchow's triad of thrombosis, there is hypercoagulability, endothelial injury, and blood stasis. If the atria are fibrillating, blood within them is much more static, which means a higher risk of clot formation. Atrial fibrillation also features activation of the coagulation cascade and there is typically fibrosis as well as endothelial dysfunction, overall giving a high risk of thrombus formation. These clots could then be pumped by the heart into the brain, causing an ischemic stroke. The brain is not the only organ this can affect. The emboli can cause intestinal or renal infarctions, myocardial infarction if they enter the coronary arteries, and acute limb ischemia. Other complications include heart failure and dementia. The diagnosis is made on evidence of atrial fibrillation on an ECG, which shows a lack of consistent P waves linked to QRS complexes, and the RR interval, which is the interval between two peaks, is usually varied, giving us the typical irregularly irregular heart rate. However, patients are not always in atrial fibrillation. 
This is why longer term halter monitoring may be used to increase the chances of capturing the arrhythmia. It is termed paroxysmal if they have atrial fibrillation for less than seven days, persistent if it lasts between seven days and a year, long standing persistent if beyond one year, and permanent if it is decided that there will be no attempt to revert the patient back to sinus rhythm. The risk is that converting someone back to sinus rhythm may cause a blood clot to be pumped through the systemic circulation, generating the complications we mentioned. In unstable patients, defined as shock, acute heart failure, syncope or myocardial ischemia, patients would receive an emergency cardioversion, as not doing so could potentially lead to death. In stable patients, however, anticoagulation is an important factor and rhythm or rate control strategies are options. Rhythm control involves cardioverting the patient back into sinus rhythm through a shock or through medication, with drugs such as flacanide or amiodarone. If the atrial fibrillation started more than 48 hours beforehand, then patients will be treated with anticoagulation for several weeks prior to the cardioversion, ablation or surgery such as the Cox maze procedure, where a maze is created to contain the abnormal electrical activity are other options. This strategy is used mostly in younger people who are more likely to maintain sinus rhythm. Rate control is used mostly in patients who are unlikely to maintain sinus rhythm, such as older patients or comorbid patients. Beta blockers, digoxin or calcium channel blockers are the most common agents used. Patients receiving rate control should also receive lifelong anticoagulation to reduce the risk of embolic complications. Direct oral anticoagulants like apixaban and rivaroxaban are now opted for more commonly than warfarin. And scores such as CHADSVASC and HASBLED, and more recently ORBIT, are used to compare the relative risk of stroke against the risk of bleeding.